that it holds the bat. When engineers design an airplane, well, we'll probably be chasing this around. They, they do all the calculations. This is a front view, a very rapid drawing of a front view of an airplane. They do all the rapid calculations and they figure what that wing will be able to support. And after all their calculations, and after they're certain, they then pile sandbags on the wing. Did you know that? Until it breaks off to make damn sure that it does the job. Now that does not exist in everyday language. In everyday language you don't have that ability. When an engineer meets another engineer, he says, I can illuminate an area with this tiny point of light that has uh, 50,000 square feet. The engineer says, well, that's not possible. He doesn't talk like that. He says, how do you power that unit? What kind of voltage does it take? How do you illuminate that spot? They ask questions. The average person, yeah, nah. Not in a thousand years. That's been around for a long time. That is a language of war, of hatred, of bigotry, of prejudice, the inability to ask questions. And we've got to be very careful about that. And at one lecture I remember at Princeton, I was trying to say that human beings cannot think or reason. This is a psychology department and sociology. But one of the individuals stood up, one of the staff, and he said, all right, where did the camera come from? There were no cameras at one time. Someone had to think about a camera. He just doesn't come out of the thin air. And after doing a lot of work, many years ago, in ancient Egypt, or if you live out in the country, or have lived out in the country, if there was a hole in the barn wall, that is, a knot was knocked out, the cows on the outside appeared on the wall of the barn, upside down. And in Egypt, you went in this dome to see the upside down world. There was a little hole here, and the daylight came in, and you saw people walking upside down on the wall. How many of you have experienced that kind of phenomenon? That is essentially the box hole camera. A camera, the simple camera without a lens, is just a little hole in a box. And somebody said, well, how can I make, how can I see that image? And they used a transparent membrane back here, and they could see the upside down head or a person or a cow. And they asked this question, if only I can retain that image. Well, that isn't the answer. That's just the question. I wonder how I could retain that image. So, years before that, the American Indians and other primitives have taken tapa cloth, or they'd weave um, natural materials into a kind of a fabric. And then they would take berry juices and dye it different colors. Sometimes a leaf would fall upon that surface, and after the sun dried it, they had an image of the leaf. So they began to use dyes from this background. That all human beings, to understand me better, the first human being that jumped off a precipice with wings, he died. And his brother-in-law wrote, next time, make the wings larger. <laughs> no one starts out right away and solves a problem, unless you have a tremendous background in many different areas. Well, the next guy that jumped off, he jumped off with the larger wings. And he flew a little, and then they went. And the old fisherman said, you got to brace them wings like a boat, like a mast. They're not going to hold, so they braced it. And then they jumped off the precipice, this individual, and he flew, and he hit a tree. And he hurt his leg real badly. And his wife said, you know, John, a fish has a rudder. Good point. And they stuck the rudder on the airplane. No one ever sat down and invented a television set, an airplane, the electric light, wireless. None of that came about by men walking in, in deep concentration. And then, through some ethereal substance, bingo, the idea is formulated. It doesn't work that way. It's hard work. And I make more mistakes than anybody I know, because I try more things. 
There's nothing wrong with building something and finding out that it doesn't work. This is where you get your experience. There's nothing wrong with criticism. I remember the first model airplanes I built went nosing into the ground, and I was ashamed of them. And uh, a young engineer told me that my center of gravity had to be corrected, that is, move the wing forward. And so all of us stand on the shoulders of one another, and we shape the future. Another question that was asked, well, somebody had to invent the bow and arrow. Somebody had to think of it. It just didn't come out of nowhere. Well, I talked to many Indians. And after talking to many Indians, this is when I found out that Indians used to skin animals. And this is a lousy drawing of the skin of an animal stretched out in the sun. When the Indians got back, the skin was half the size. It shrunk and became thicker. And they didn't like that at all. So they cut leather into strips, thin strips. And they took an existing frame and they tied that skin to the frame. Some of you may have seen this. A place of leather all the way to prevent it from shrinking. But when they cut the strips of leather and put them out in the sun, they shrunk and became fat and short. And they were displeased with that. After many, many years, one Indian tied that strand of leather to a piece of wood, a, a stick, a stick. He split the top, tied a knot, and tied the leather to the stick. When he came back, hoping that it would dry and not shrink, the stick took this form. It was bent. Ah! He plucked at it and went, bang! Well, and after many years, somebody took another piece of wood, put it in, pulled the string, and off it went. Well, if man can't think or reason, where did the movie camera come from? Somebody had to think of that. It doesn't exist out there. Well, here's where it came from. Many, many years ago, thousands of years ago, in China, they used to take a candle, and they'd take some bamboo paper at the time, and put it in front of the candle, and then they'd cut out a little figurine of a human being and put the candle behind it. And as the candle undulated, the little person would dance, and they'd play music. That was the beginning. How did that happen? Some guy had a candle and a piece of paper, and he, was, he was just happened to be behind it, and his finger m appeared to move on the screen. And so he extracted, or built upon that phenomena. Then later, something interesting occurred. The Chinese used to take these tremendous scrolls and open them up. Well, they then later taped, or they wired, or they used gut and tied many pages together and built a kind of a pad. But in order to get to a particular page, the Oriental would mark the corner of the page so that they can find with a symbol. And as you flip through the pages fast, that little dot would jump all over the place. Well, years later, an individual drew various successive pictures of a bird in flight and put them down on the corner of the paper and flipped it. And the little bird wings began to move up and down. Well, a Frenchman saw that and he took a little pieces of cardboard and he put him in a circular pattern. Uh, I'm going to try to get it down as clear as I can quickly. And he put a crank up here that you turn and the little pictures would go around the circle. And the Chinese had something like this also and they had a bamboo interrupter that would just hold the picture for a few seconds, a second, less than a second. As you turned it, a man appeared to move across the screen. Well, a French machine machined that out of brass, did a beautiful job, and when you turn the crank, the person walked with smoother motions rather than these abrupt motions. Edison saw that unit that the Frenchman designed, and he turned it into this position. I, I guess I can't work with that microphone. Uh, can you hear me back there? Okay. And what happened is, uh, he turned it into a vertical position, and all the pictures were set in a circular fashion. 
Excuse and you me. turn the crank here. Yeah. Excuse me. It, they won't get the audio on the camera. Oh, I'm sorry. Why don't you Thank just you. put it in your pocket or something? I'll try. <laughs> here, hook it to your waist. Slip it in your pocket. Thanks. Roxanne is my associate. She works on all the buildings and all the things that we've developed in the Venus Project, which I'll talk to you about later. And he, Edison purchased this, put a magnifying glass in front of it, and you put a nickel in, and you turn the crank, and you saw people moving. A bunch of still photographs. It was a long, slow process. Nobody, no individual invented the camera. A little bit here, a little there, added to that, and eventually the Wright brothers read about experimental aircraft, where thousands of people died trying to develop a flying machine. And after picking up bits of this information, including man carrying kites from China thousands of years ago, and they built the first flying machine. And they were called the father of flight. Again, there's no father of anything. You may take an idea so far, you add to it, and gradually it's built up. A genius. A genius is a person that has been exposed to many different systems. And therefore, they can come up with a wide range of solutions. A man like Leonardo da Vinci. You think that he, he just evolved out of nothing? He spoke to people that were interested in mechanics in his time. They gathered and they shared ideas. But you only hear of da Vinci. Unfortunately, guys like Nikolai Tesla, Edison, all the great innovators of the past have been influenced by other people. And the mythical structures that we build around inventors, that they inherit special abilities, they are geniuses, or they're in tune with the infinite mind, and the ideas somehow filter in. Well, this is a kind of nonsense. It's the same story about is there intelligent life out there? The real question is, is there intelligent life here? <laughs> we don't think so, not yet. I'm serious, I'm not kidding. What is intelligence? Well, the ability to reason things out, you can't have that ability unless you've had experience in particular areas. An Eskimo never dreams, I repeat this, of walking on a palm-fringed beach. Can you understand that? It is not possible unless he has seen motion pictures or something about the beach. It is not possible for any human being to build a frame of reference of any kind without experience. I know where every invention I ever made came from. I know the influence, the books I've read, the people I've known, everything that shaped those values. <laughs> and sometimes people say, well, when did you think of that wonderful idea? It was the February the 1st? No, it's cumulative bits of information that we put together with experience. So all of the artificial structures and artificiality of all societies, they are all primitive today. They are all backward. The very fact that we use political systems, the very fact that there are Democrats and Republicans and notions about how the world ought to be governed. Now scientists could not do a thing with that. If you want to put a man on the moon, you have to know what the distance is precisely. You have to know how much material you're lifting up toward the moon. You have to know how much force a human body can stand. Well, to start with, they don't have that information. So they build special devices, a big centrifuge. They put a human being in it, and they whirl it around. They say, how are you doing? And the guy conks out, and they say, well, this is how fast you can rotate certain groups of people. And they build data, and from that data, they plan the moon voyage. The question then is, what kind of world do we want? How is it that we want our social system to operate? What makes criminal behavior 